Well, my name is uh, Brandon. I'm the youth and young adults pastor here at Simple Church, um, and I get the privilege of finishing off our series, The Always God, this morning, where we've been talking about this God and how our God and how he is an always God, like how the God within the pages of the Bible is as relevant today as he was when they were written. Or as the author of Hebrews puts it, um, he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the past couple weeks, we've been learning how God is always speaking. He's always hearing. He's always seeing. He's always pursuing. And today, we are going to learn how he always restores, and he's always restoring. But before we get into that, I'm curious, and I wonder, many of you may have noticed there's a um, unique item on your tables. And so if you each want to reach, there should be one for each of you in the center of your tables. Go ahead, grab it. You can see it. Can anyone tell me what this is? Go ahead and scream it out. Play-Doh, come on, raise your, take your Play-Doh and lift it high in the air and wave it around like you just don't care if Play-Doh marked your childhood. If you know this stuff, if you use this stuff, go ahead, pop it open, pop it open, take a whiff. Oh man, this is a little bit harder than you would think. Ah, doesn't that just restore your childhood? No, no, it restores mine. It takes me back, and maybe it takes you back. Um, but I'm also wondering, many of you in here, we can all agree, man, Play-Doh is a part of it. But I wonder, do you know how this stuff came about? Do you know how this stuff was created? And I'm gonna, I want to tell you this morning because it, I think it has importance for us this morning, or at least I think it's really cool. Well, I found out and discovered how Play-Doh was created of all places amidst a rom-com that I was watching with my wife. And it was a rom-com called How Do You Know? You know, Reese Witherspoon, Owen Wilson, our boy Paul Rudd, um, Jack Nicholson, some of the best, right? And, and this movie, if you're not familiar, is, it's like any rom-com, you know, filled with like, oh, do we like each other? Do we not? Like, what is life? And what should we do? You know, like all that. But the premise of this movie is Reese Witherspoon is, uh, she's a professional baseball player and she's coaching this Olympic team and she finds out that her time is coming to an end. And it's because she's, she's at that age where they need someone new. And so she heads into the season of life where it's like, everything I have worked for is ending. What do I do now? How do I know? And all the other characters in this movie, too, are dealing with levels of that. But hers is the focus. And there's this craziness going on. And you're feeling the tension of, like, how does she know what to do next? And then there's this climatic, climactic moment in the movie where Paul Rudd's character sits down for dinner, she likes him, try, or he likes her, and trying to impress her, and, and he gives her a really strange gift, and in the gift is a can of Play-Doh, and she looks kind of weirdly at him, like, really, bro, <laughs> like, you know, this is what, and he's like, no, wait, it comes with a story, and he goes on to explain that Play-Doh was originally invented to help clean soot off wallpaper, it was this white goo, because back then they heated things with coal, and it got all over your house, and so you had to clean it off, but then, Gas and electric heating came in, and the people, or go back to the, the other slide, this, or the, the one right before that, this, see this wall cleaner, right, by Kutal, and you can wait on the next one, um, but Kutal, wall, Kutal products, or go back, go back, go back, stay on this one, I'll tell you when, um, <laughs> so stay on this one, uh, but this wall cleaner was invented by the McVickers, and it was doing really well, it was one of their most well sold products, and then like I said, gas and electric heating came in, and they started to go under. And so they started to ask the question, like, how, what do we do? How do we, how do we know, right? And then it was Joe McVicker's um, sister-in-law, Kay Zufall, who suggested, who fight, found out that her kids loved playing with this stuff. She worked in a nursery school, and they loved playing with this stuff. And so she suggested they color it, and they call it Play-Doh. And so we had the first can of Play-Doh. And then in that, you know, you have to have that quote from every movie, that moment. And so Paul Rudd, leans in, gets really close, and says, I've kept this for years as proof that we are all just one small adjustment away from making our lives work, from making our lives work. And although, although Paul Rudd may have not known or the movie creators were just looking for emotion, I think there's some truth in this statement, and that's what I want to talk about this morning, because the reality is, and the reason I start here is because all of us have faced are amidst facing or will face this question that this movie poses, right? How do you know? Or rather, how do I know? How do I know what to do next? How do I know that I'm going to be okay? How do I know that I'm worth anything? And so whether for you it's been you've lost your job, you've gone through a breakup or a divorce, you've battled addiction, you've suffered abuse, 
you face severe sickness or had the loss of a loved one. The list goes on and on. The result, the reality is this question is one that we all face in the light of our broken world. In fact, if you haven't faced anything like this, I, I, one, I want to talk to you and see how you've gotten past without facing anything like this. But the reality is you will, as Jesus tells his disciples and in turn us, that here on this earth we will face trials and sorrows. Not if, but we will. That's just the reality of the broken world that we live in. And, and, and I have experienced this firsthand as I've been doing ministry over time and seen time and time again, I've seen this to be true. As I've talked to people this past month, I've talked to young adults who've battled porn addiction. I've talked to people here. I know people in this room who've, who've went through, have gone through divorce. I've talked to students who struggle with homosexuality and gender identity, and I have even wrestled myself as a pastor a father and a husband many times that like, did I screw everything up? Am I doing this right? How do I know? And unfortunately, what I've also seen that's unfortunate in the church is sometimes we respond to this in the incorrect way, right? Like I've seen many times that it's communicated, whether intentional or not, that the church has falsely communicated that because of maybe doubts in your life or things going on in your life, or decisions you've made, that, that you're now worthless, that, that you're now condemned, that you just need to have more faith because doubt, you can't have that. Like, you just have to have more doubt. Would you just be a better Christian? And, and that isn't true. I mean, there's truth in it, and I get the sentiment, like, like the idea that, hey, we want to encourage you to live a life that follows Jesus and that his way for you, and don't want, we don't want you to doubt because there's, there's freedom in Christ. There is no fear. These things are true, and in fact, it's made clear in Scripture that things like divorce and drunkenness and sex outside of marriage and idolatry and porn and masturbation, practicing homosexuality, changing your gender, whatever it may be, these are not God's best for you, and I as a pastor will continue to do my best to clearly communicate those things because not only do I trust God over myself, but I've also seen the destruction that those lifestyles can lead to. But what is also true that scripture clearly communicates is that no one is beyond redemption. That those who've accepted Jesus as the forgiver of their sin and the Lord of their lives are no longer condemned. Just like we see the God of the Bible restoring his people of the past, God is still restoring his people today. And this message is for you no matter what stage of life you're in, no matter where you're at your walk with Christ. And so that's what I want to talk about. Because to know this in your life, to have the knowledge of a God who is always restoring and the peace and confidence that that comes along with that, it takes one small adjustment. We're all just one small adjustment away from that peace and purpose and confidence that Christ offers us. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning. And I hope it'll bless you as much as it has blessed me as I've studied this. Um, and uh, if you will receive it, I think you'll be really blessed this morning. So let's pray, and then we'll dive in. Father, I come to you this morning just to thank you so much for your message this morning. I thank you for the privilege that I get to be up here. <laughs> like, what, who am I that I get to stand before your people and share your words with them or share your truths with them? And so set any inadequacies I have aside, God. I know I am flawed, but through you, your message is flawless. And so I pray that you'd speak through me to the hearts and minds of those who need it this morning and that we would receive it and leave here with a peace and confidence that you desire for us. Um, and so we give this time to you. All glory be to your name. Um, amen. Amen. All right. So to dive into this, we're going to be looking at a story from the book of Jeremiah. And if you are not familiar, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with Jeremiah, he was an Israelite priest who lived and worked during the final decades of the kingdom of southern Judah. And he was called as a prophet to warn Israel. He was called by God to warn Israel. He had a great task. I'm sure all of us would want this. This is what he had to tell Israel. He had to tell, go into Israel and tell them of the severe consequences of breaking their covenant with God through idolatry and justice. And so through Jeremiah, God basically condemns Israel for their sins, and he challenges them to put their trust in him, saying that those who trust him will be blessed, while those who don't will be cursed. And here's the point when I'm reading scripture that I like to, I get, I, guys, my brain, 
Like, I'm wired in a different way, okay? And, and, and I like to get into the story, and I like to imagine what it would have been like for those who would have been receiving this message for the first time, right? Like, like this, these are actual letters that, or actual things that happen in history, and so Jeremiah is telling Israel, he's prophesying over Israel, and I kind of wonder how it was received, right? Because Israel, if it's getting to this point, they've turned pretty far from God. And so Jeremiah is stepping in and saying, you, this, you need to know this. There's consequences. You're going to be condemned. And I imagine that like today, there was probably many Israelites who just shrugged it off. They're like, bro, you, okay, you do your God thing. Like, I'm going to go over here. I imagine that was the case. Maybe some of them were like, okay, where was God when that happened? Where was God in that pain? Like, the God you speak of isn't in my life. Or maybe some of them were like, I've, I've tried God. I can't do that. It's not working. Or some of them you may have even said, I'm too far gone. Like, God can't use me. It's over for me. And so all these emotional responses I would imagine would have taken place when, it, when uh, Jeremiah stepped in and, and spoke on behalf of God. And I'm sure even Jeremiah getting the responses that he has because if, if, you've, been in, if you've been in ministry at all, there's sometimes where people, you want so much for them and, and they won't see it and they won't receive it. And you just are like, God, are you even using me? And this is where we jump in to Jeremiah 18. And God has a message for Jeremiah and the Israelites, and I believe for us today. And he says this, we're told this in the book of Jeremiah, verses 18, 1 through 6. Is we're told, the Lord God gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the potter's shop, and I will speak to you there. So I did, as he told me, and found the potter working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message. O oh, Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. And so in this passage, we see God is getting Jeremiah's attention. He's getting Israel's attention. And in turn, later as we read this story, he's getting our attention. He's trying to teach a valuable lesson using the metaphor of a potter in clay. Now, show of hands, how many of you are experienced like Pot, pot throwing, you know, you throw pottery. What is, you throw clay. Anybody in here? Okay, we've got like one, two. My hand's up just as an example. I do not. Like, <laughs> like I, my only experience was in high school when we had art class, and I was like, this is so hard. Like, you know, and so, so I don't know much about clay. But, and so I, as I was, got the opportunity of studying into this, I'm like, okay, I got to dig further, deeper into this. And as I did, I discovered as, as most of the time is with the metaphors in Scripture, is it is so profound what God is doing here. It is so profound the lesson he is trying to teach us, right? Like, so for example, check out this. He said, but the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. Did not turn out as he hoped. And, and this Hebrew word, the word used here to describe was turning, was not turning out as he had hoped, did not turn out as he hoped, is it's a Hebrew word used to, that translates to mean behave corruptly or cause trouble. Anybody have had that maybe in their life, whether yourselves or your own children? Um, it can also mean to ruin or destroy, or in other translations, it's translated as spoiled or marred, which is this condition that potters will often refer to their clay as spoiled or marred because it becomes unworkable, right? It becomes, it gets lumps of clay or it breaks and it can't be used anymore. The potter can't move forward with his original intention. And this is where I see the first point God is making, that we are all broken. We're all broken. We all break. We are part of a broken world. We've all done things will, and will do things that disrupt God's purpose for us. And I believe we all saw a pretty good example of this within the past weeks. If you've probably heard the news of the slap heard around the world, um, the interaction between Will Smith and uh, Chris Rock and if you haven't, basically what happened is there was the Oscars, it was all online, nobody was watching it, but everybody was interested after this happened. Um, but Chris Rock made a joke about Will's wife, and Will decided to defend his wife. He would step up on stage in front of everybody and slap Chris Rock across the face, and then yell obscenities at Chris Rock, saying, don't do that again. And I've seen all sorts of videos and people talking about their thoughts on whether Chris Rock shouldn't have told that joke or, or whether Will Smith should have had tougher skin or no, it was, it was good of him to defend his wife. Nobody should talk to him like that. And I'm not here to debate what was right or wrong, right, because enough people have said things about it. But what is interesting to me that I noticed in all the videos I watched or the comments I've seen made is not many people are talking about 
I wonder what was going through Chris Rock's head. I wonder what was going through Will Smith's head. And I don't even mean in the moment. I mean when they left the Oscars and Chris Rock got home and he was no longer Chris Rock the celebrity, but he was Chris Rock the person. And he had a moment to himself. And I just imagine him thinking, man, I shouldn't have told that joke. Or Will Smith going home and you saw some of his emotion in the speech he gave afterwards when he accepted the Oscar for King Richard. But then when he got home, and he's alone, and he's no longer Will Smith the celebrity, but Will Smith the person, and starts to think, maybe, man, why did I do that? What was I thinking? How am I going to get past this? Will everything be okay? And my heart breaks for them because of that. But this is what sin does, is it corrupts us. In Genesis, God is actually talking to Cain as he's on the verge of committing the first murder in the Bible, and he says, sin is crouching at your door like a beast seeking to devour you. And we saw this firsthand this past week, and I'm sure you've experienced it in your own life, is this is what sin does, is it corrupts us, it mars us, it breaks the relationship that we have between, with God and with his people, with humanity. But it's also, I found, it's easy to point it out in others, like Will Smith and Chris Rock, but it becomes harder to point it out in ourselves, right? And so the question we have to ask, I believe, is do we believe and understand this truth? Because I talk to so many people that this is so hard to wrestle with, is to come to the place where it's like, no, I am broken. I am in need of a savior. I can't do this on my own. And so have you asked yourself that question? And what has been your response? Whether it's been on yourself or by somebody else or maybe another way to put it is when you hear the words of Paul in his letter to the Romans where he says, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. What is your response to that? Is it, is it one of, okay, yeah, 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 but I've accepted, I've accepted Jesus and, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm a good person and so that's why I'm going to get into heaven because I do good things now. I don't, I don't need, like the, that, that verse is referring to those, those people, those people who do bad things, like they're bad, or I, but I'm pretty good, I'm pretty good. I don't need that. Or is your heart broken over this to a point where it's like, you get hit to your knees, whether re really or figuratively, and you go, God, I need you. Are you heartbroken over the fact that we are broken, that you are broken? Because this is the first step to that one small adjustment. This is that first step to that one small adjustment. And another way to put it is we can't receive what we need without first recognizing our need for it. We cannot receive what we need without first recognizing our need for it. But the good news is that although we may all be broken, this is not where it ends. God goes on. In his letter and all throughout scripture, but right here as he continues to speak through the prophet Jeremiah, he says, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. God is saying that just as the potter can redeem the clay that has been marred, he can redeem us. Or as Paul also says in his letter to the Romans, he says, but God showed his great love that while we were still sinners, he sent Christ to die for us. That we don't need to make ourselves right before God will make us right. Does that make sense? Like, you don't need to be perfect and come to God perfect before you can be in relationship with him, before you can be used by him. No, he sent Christ to die while you were still a sinner. Because he knew he was the only one who could get you out of that. But this point applies to all of us. Those who are far from Christ, as well as those who have come to him. Because what I've realized is that there's two type of people that God can't use. First, it's those who have decided they don't need him. Those who maybe you talk to, like Jesus comes up or God comes up, and they're like, yeah, you do your God, like I'm good, I'm, 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 I'm the goat. Call me God King. Like, I'm the one who's going to make it happen. I made my business. I made my life. I make, you know, it's, I can do it. And they decide they don't need God. But then there's also those that maybe have come to accept Jesus, and I see this over and over again. And I don't think it's intentional, but they've recognized Christ as their Savior, but then they decide they no longer need him. And, and I get the sentiment in doing this because what I find happens is maybe you've experienced so much 
wrong in your life or you've done things and you get to a point where it's like, oh my gosh, I realize what Jesus has done for me. And now it's like, okay, Jesus, you take the bench. You did all the work. Now I'm going to do for you. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to do it. You go ahead. And, and the problem in this thinking is you can't. You can't do it. I think of one of the most quoted scriptures in the Christian faith that we talk about is Galatians 5.22 through 23, where this is Paul, again, writing to the church in Galatia, and he says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. But my experience in the church has been multiple times where it's, it's spoken over you. You gotta, you gotta just try for these things. You gotta do these things, Right? And then I heard this great analogy from Ben Stewart. If you're not familiar with him, I love this analogy he shares. And I would ask, how many of you in here, um, you can wait on that. Um, how many of you in here like apples? It, it, maybe you have a favorite apple. Go ahead and shout one out at me. Like what? Honeycrisp. Come on. Um, my favorite's the Fuji. Come on, do I have any Fuji lovers in here? Where are my people? Come on. What, what do we got over here? Okay, yeah, that's, uh, you got to introduce me, man. Um, <laughs> but there's a lot of good apples. Now, for all of you who have apples, have you ever grown an apple off your arm? Why not? Because you can't. But what if you just try harder? Right? Like if I asked you to stand up and said, but you just try really hard and you'll get an apple, you would say, no, that's, I'm not built and capable of doing that. Now go back to this verse, if you will, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. It is not you, friend. It is the Holy Spirit working through you that brings these things out of you. You can't try harder and make these things come into your life. It's only by submitting to the Holy Spirit in your life that these things will start to come out. And, and, and as Ben Stewart said, I've brought this up multiple times, now we're ready. Um, as Ben Stewart has said, and I've, I've said this a couple weeks ago, is our assurance of salvation does not come from perfection, but from progress. And what I mean by that is, yes, when you accept Christ, you are made right with God and you are promised an, eternal, an inheritance of eternal life. But if you've been in this world long at all, you know that it, it doesn't make, once you accept Jesus, it's not like everything is just perfect or that you're just perfect. That, that now everything, you don't, there's no failure anymore. There's no like growing process. It's not like in a click. You're just all of a sudden made into this perfect. And so what happens is the moment you accept Christ is you are promised an eternal life with him. You're given that inheritance. He's now your Lord. You've given your life to him. But then the Holy Spirit enters into your life and through the process of what we call sanctification begins to work through you to be more in Christ's likeness. And that is a progression. That's a process. Or another way of saying it, is salvation is when God's shaping work starts in our life, not when it stops. And I think a lot of us need to hear that and be reminded of that because I see so many, including myself, can start to beat ourselves up when we start to think, man, why am I not over this thing anymore? Why do I keep screwing up? Or why do those circumstances keep happening in my life? Why do I keep... But then ask yourself, where were you a week ago? Where were you a month ago? Where were you a year ago? Have you seen progress? And I would say, if you're even getting upset over those questions, I tell people all the time, that is a sign of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because someone without that wouldn't even be, they'd be like, whatever. Like, this is, this is the way you do life. I do me, YOLO, let's go. Like, that, that, and so by you asking those questions, I would say that, that is an indicator of the Holy Spirit in your life. Not the only one. But it's an indicator because a salvation is our assurance of that is a progress, not perfection. And as we see in Scripture and as we see in our lives, there are times where we can still step outside of God's will. We can choose to sin against or disobey our Heavenly Father. And we can make decisions that cause lumps to form in the clay of our life. So in short, what God is saying here through the prophet Jeremiah is only he, only God can restore the broken. I can't restore my brokenness. You can't restore your brokenness. Right. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. Only the potter has the power over the clay, and only he can shape, and he can only shape us when we humble ourselves in realization of this reality. When we come to a place where we go, I need you, then you're in a good place if you're there, because then God can work with you. It's as one of my students so proud stated, I've been in youth ministry for over 15 years, 
And, uh, and one of my students, and it's so funny when students say like really profound things and they don't realize it, <laughs> like it's so great. And so he said this thing, and we posted it on TikTok because that's what you do. Um, but he said this thing and he said, you can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped. You can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped. That's a good reminder for us too as Christians trying to share the gospel with people. Like you, 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 Jesus says you can't throw pearls to the pigs. We cannot help someone who doesn't want to be helped. And now we joke about that, and he's like, you still use that? And I'm like, yeah, it was good. Um, <laughs> but here's what I've noticed in that statement, too, is that sin or, or the li- like us living in it, it leads to a hardening of our hearts. It leads to a hardening. It reminds me of one of the most frustrating things about this stuff. Okay, if you've had Play-Doh for a while, um, like this past weekend, my daughter, or last weekend, not, not just yesterday, but last weekend, um, she decided to get out all of our Play-Doh. And then you get in, you're all excited, and she has all the contraptions, we're getting up, and then you pop open your favorite color, and you're like, oh my gosh, the lid wasn't snapped on tight enough. And it's like all hard and brittle, and you're like, this stuff, this is terrible, I'm throwing you away, like you're worthless now. And it, it's just so frustrating. Has anyone been there? Like you just get to that point, and you're like, oh, why didn't I just cap the lid, right? And it reminds me that in a similar way, when we decide to live outside God's design for us, it can cause us to become hard and become more and more unworkable. You know, even the slightest cat, you know, distinction of the lid being undone over time will lead to a hardening of the Plato, and in the same way, lead to a hardening in our lives. And some of you here have sinned. I would actually, I'll take that further. All of you, like if you're in this earth, like I've sinned. But some of you also are still living in sin. I've talked to people here that are still living in sin. And no condemnation, no judgment, but I want to be honest with you. Because I've had people where I've sat across from them, they've told me that they love Jesus, he's the Lord of their life, and then sin's pointed out in their life, and they go, yeah, but I'm not changing. I like the way I'm doing things. And it breaks my heart when I hear that. Because what has happened in those moments, and if that is you, is you've allowed, or maybe you've allowed that sin and the deceitfulness of it or the consequences of it, whether it's in your past and you look back and you go, man, those circumstances, or, or, or whether you're living in it now and there's a deceitfulness to it where it feels good in the moment, and you've allowed it to harden you. You've allowed it to harden your heart. Maybe you even have allowed it to let you believe that you are worthless. Much like when I find that Play-Doh and I go, oh my gosh, this is, this is worthless, and I throw it out. Maybe you've started to believe that about your life, and are low, you believe you're no longer to be able to be used. And then if that's you, I want to make you aware of the final truth that we see in this story, and all throughout the Bible, is that God wants to restore you. God wants to restore you. How do I know this? How do I know this? Because God created you and I like clay. And you might be going, wait, wait, what? <laughs> right? Let me prove it to you. Check this out. Genesis 2-7 says, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Can anyone tell me where clay comes from? Dirt. It comes from dirt. It comes from the dust, and you pull it out of the ground, and you form it. So we're all clay. Okay, we can go home. You're good. <laughs> no, we're all like clay. We were formed from the dust, just like clay. However, this is not the only similarity between us and clay. Because as we just talked about, and this is the same with clay, the, the experience that we have when this stuff dries out and you uncap it and you leave and it's become to a point where it's no longer formable, it's no longer workable, I used to just throw it out. I just told you that. But after this weekend, I was like, okay, you know what? We on a budget, and I'm going to get the most out of the toy. This is not going to happen. I'm not going to let my clay be ruined. And so I went to YouTube where you find out all the best information and tips, right? And I looked up, can clay be restored? And I found out that it takes one small adjustment. All you have to do is add water. And I tried it. And it works. <laughs> so if your parents take that parenting tip away, you got to do it right. I didn't do it right, and it like, got all mushy, and so now i got to do some weird things with it. But it works, this one small adjustment. And it is the same with clay. As you get into clay, and I'm excited for you guys to go through your uh, small group study this week because we dive deeper into this, but there are different stages of clay that potters go through. And at each stage, it gets harder and harder and harder because you're forming it. But at any stage, it can become marred or spoiled or broken. And the potter at any time can just add water to it and take it back to a former stage where it is now more workable and formable once again. And what I find so interesting about this, okay, 
This is so cool to me. Is all throughout Scripture, we're told from Jesus comes living water. And so what I want to remind you of today is no matter where you are in life, you can decide to return to him. And you can receive his living water and you can be restored. And again, what I mean by that is for those of you who don't know Christ and are just here checking it out, I'm, I'm so excited for you because like God is after you. Tom mentioned a couple weeks ago this poem called The Hounds of Heaven and the Hounds of Heaven are after you and I can't wait till they win. Uh, but also for those of you who have come to Jesus, accepted him, and maybe you've been in this walk for some time and you've gotten to a point where you feel like you're not progressing, you're not growing, and you're starting to wonder why, and I would just ask the question, has something else become the center of your life? Whether it be work, whether it be a hobby, whether it be a friend group, whether it be even family, as good as those things are, they cannot substitute for Jesus. And I want to encourage you, at any point, you can return to Jesus as the center, because there's this other thing about clay, is that when you're on the wheel and you're forming it, it moves best when it is completely center. And so we must be centered on Christ. Christ must be the center and the source of our lives for the progression that he desires for us to take place, for the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. And you can make do here and there, but when he is the center, I guarantee you, you will be blessed. And so I want to remind you today that no matter where you're at, whether you're far from Christ, whether you've come to him and gone away, or whether you're just kind of figuring out how to do this walk, you can return to him and receive his living water, and he will begin to restore you. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, or how much you've failed. The Father, like the potter, is capable and willing to restore you if you would allow him. Because there is a God. This is the story. If you're not familiar with the Bible, this is it right here. There is a God that loves you so much that he entered the human condition. He left his divine status of the God of the universe and entered into the human condition so he could bear the weight of sin on your behalf so that you wouldn't have to. And now for any of us who believe in him, as in Romans 10, 9 through, 9, 9 through 10 says, that if we openly declare that he is Lord and believe in our heart that he was raised from the dead, that being Jesus, we are saved that we now have the inheritance of eternal life. And so that is all it takes. And then we are gifted with the Holy Spirit to experience life to the full and, and experience it to the full. And then also we have Jesus to go back to at any time we fail or falter. And so just like this Plato was restored or is restored when you add water to it, um, there's one of these at each of your table. You've already grabbed them. These are for you to take home. Because I want you to be reminded this week, and on, I can't put it on a cabinet, put it on your door dash, I want you, or your door dash, I door dash, <laughs> your, your dash of your car, <laughs> put it on there to be reminded this week that you are one small adjustment away from making your life work. That you are one small adjustment away from having the peace and confidence that Jesus desires for you and receiving his living water that will give you life to the full. Let me pray that you would. Um, Father, I come to you this morning. Whew, thank you for the privilege of Plato. <laughs> thank you for the privilege of clay and your metaphors through them. And thank you for the privilege of being up here and sharing your word, God. I pray it has blessed somebody this morning. I pray for the person who has drifted from you, that they are reminded that they can come back to you, make you the center of their life, and experience what you have for them. And I pray for those that don't know you yet, that nothing that they've done or nothing of their past or nothing that they are in right now is too far for you to restore and that all they have to do is come to a place of humility and accept their need for you. Um, and I pray they would have the confidence and the courage to talk to somebody about that today. Um, but we give it all to you, God. We love you and are so grateful for the life that you gave on our behalf so that we could have eternal life with you. And now for the way that you partner with us in creation so that we can become more and more like you and begin to do the things that you did to bless this world. We love you, God. Praise your name, Jesus. All for your glory. Amen.